Welcome to The Referral with me, Dr. Curran. This is your go-to podcast for evidence-based health information without the pseudoscience. Every week, I'll be chatting to experts and interesting guests, bringing you updates from the world of science and debunking ridiculous medical myths. Are we in the midst of an infertility crisis? Are we becoming more infertile as a species? Today's episode is gonna revolve all around infertility and what we can do to counteract it and how we can improve our fertility to give us the best chance of conception. How much does egg freezing cost? Can you freeze embryos? And what are the risks and side effects of these things? Who better to tackle this interesting subject than Dr. Helen O'Neill, a world leading expert in reproductive science. She's also a lecturer in reproductive and molecular genetics. If you have irregular periods, heavy bleeding, too much bleeding, too little bleeding, those are signs that your body is actually under distress. The egg is so important. It's the largest cell in the body. Just yeah. saying. Yeah. And yeah. the sperm is the smallest cell in the body. <laughs> just saying. Hey, don't come near my don't egg. Don't come near my egg until your you're... subpar sperm. Uh, yeah, Go on until you're suited in. I'm going to be giving you lots of information and asking my guests lots of questions, but I'm not left you out. You'll also get the chance to ask me a question in crowd science. If you've got a really important question that you're desperate to get answered, feel free to get in touch at thereferralpod.com. And if you enjoy my myth busting and the deep dives I go into on your questions, you can get more of this if you go to the referral show page on Apple Podcasts and hit the try free button at the top of the page to start your free trial today. If you do that, then you'll unlock the Crowd Science Extra episode that sits right under this one on the feed. All right, enough of that. It's time to see what fresh offerings we have in the world of science, health and medicine. What the hell? AI, artificial intelligence, contrary to what you might have heard, might be our savior. With all the dystopian predictions about how AI is gonna turn into Skynet and then enslave the human race, this story might surprise you and might help us beat cancer. Scientists at Harvard University have created an AI with an algorithm that can help us predict someone's risk of pancreatic cancer. Now I've spoken about pancreatic cancer many times before and the reason is it's an absolute devil. It's one of the most aggressive types of cancer killing 88% of people within five years of diagnosis. And the reason for this is it's often picked up too late and it's asymptomatic for many months or many years and the symptoms sometimes only appear once it's too late and the pancreatic cancer has metastasized or spread to other organs. And at this point, it's generally too late and people have a lifespan of maybe a few weeks or months. But these Harvard scientists have trained an AI with tens of thousands of patients' medical records and built this AI which can predict someone's risk of pancreatic cancer just by looking at their medical records alone. And once you have someone at a high risk of pancreatic cancer using this AI algorithm, you can then put them forward for screening. Now the AI algorithm is only as good as the data you train it on. The researchers train their AI on the patient record of 6.2 million patients in Denmark spanning 41 years. And included in this data set were 24,000 pancreatic cancer sufferers. Now when the AI was looking at all of these patients medical records and then correlating it with patients who had suffered pancreatic cancer, it was able to discern certain features and health patterns associated with pancreatic cancer. Things like anemia, weight loss, and various other medical conditions. Now, the AI can dredge through millions and millions of data points that a, simply a human being or a doctor can't do. Now, what does this mean in real terms? Now, the AI is not able to look at a patient's medical records and say for certain that a patient has an X percent chance of developing pancreatic cancer, but it can can give a relative risk of the disease. As an example of how effective the AI was in this study, for every thousand patients that the AI flagged, 320 went on to develop pancreatic cancer. And of these 320 patients, there were 70 people who ordinarily would probably have missed screening and wouldn't ordinarily have been put forward for any screening test or any sort of investigation. Now, this is very early stage research. It needs to be trained on global databases, ethnic minorities, different genders. So it needs a lot more than just a Danish population cohort of data, but the future is promising. And that's it with What The Health for this week. Let's get into all things fertility with Dr. Helen O'Neill. You are a fertility expert or a reproductive science expert. Tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do, and one super interesting fact about your job. I am a molecular geneticist. So my background is in 
prenatal genetics and fetal medicine and I did a PhD in stem cell genetics and developmental biology, specifically looking at the formation of the ovary uh, before becoming a lecturer in reproductive and molecular genetics at University College London, where I lecture master's students and medical students about all things reproduction, fertility, infertility, uh, anatomy, embryology. And one super interesting thing about my job is the fact that even now when I present to, at conferences about some of the cutting edge tools that we're using at the moment, people think that this is like sci-fi. But the context of it are things that we've been doing for over 30 years. So it yeah. amazes me to this day how out of touch people are about modern science practices within clinical medicine. It seems that we probably know more about things which are at the bottom of the ocean or in outer space than we do about gynecology. It's one of my favourite things to say is that we have spent more money and time mapping our galaxies than our gyne. Oh dear. So I wanted to do a deep dive on fertility and just... You know, you, those kind of facts which are thrown around online about how, you know, women are born with all the embryo or all the eggs that they will ever have in their entire lifetime, which obviously is true. But looking at some of the stats and the decay curve of how many eggs are lost over the years is quite a shocking read going from maybe one to two million when, you know, a woman is born to three, four hundred thousand at puberty and then one or two thousand at menopause around the age of 50. I mean, that is shocking statistics. It's the fastest aging organ that we have is the ovary. So wow. what's more than just being born with all the eggs we've, we'll ever have. To me, what's more interesting is that the eggs we're born with, we've really had through generations. So the eggs that I ha have, you know, have in my ovaries uh, that were laid down while I was in my mum's uterus uh, that have were affected by when her mother was, um, or her mother's diet. To me, what's interesting is the transgenerational impact of our lives on our grandchildren because of how early on our egg cells are formed. So, you know, conceivably, your eggs were predetermined or the number of your eggs were predetermined when your grandmother was pregnant with your mother. Exactly. Which is crazy. I mean, it's kind of like a long, rich history of, you know, eggs being planned in, in advance. If, you know, more, now more than ever, you hear these headlines about, you know, the human species being more infertile compared to several decades ago. Now, specifically focusing on women and the infertility crisis that you you know hear about on the news headlines are we becoming more infertile yes we are and it's for a number of reasons so when we look at fertility or infertility actually when you look at the NIH list of reasons for infertility in in women um there are 11 different listed causes whether it's genetic ovulatory whether it's uterine whether it's chromosomal there's lots of different reasons but the number one cause for modern day infertility is age. So we are simply waiting much later in life mm. before we start our families. And as a result, that has the biggest impact. That is really compounded by the change over the last few decades in our lifestyles. Women are drinking more, they're taking drugs, they're exposed to so many chemical uh, compounds within cosmetics, within just everyday you know, household detergents. We are constantly exposed to both compounds that affect our fertility, but also alter our hormone imbalance. So there's really a lot of reasons why our fertility has suffered but the number one reason is that we are giving ourselves the worst possible chance by leaving it later. Apart from the classic smoking and alcohol, what are some, you know, fiends for reproductive health that we should take more notice of, but we don't? Well, it's interesting that they say that both women and children are more exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals, namely um, phthalates, which are released mm. when we um, heat plastics. And one of the main reasons, in my opinion, that that is the case, they say it's because children chew on plastic toys and they have plastic toys. Um, but in reality, when you look at nappies and this direct exposure um, to really not good quality plastics that are put in the majority of nappies or menstrual products for women and cosmetics, we are literally exposing our skin, as which is, which is an organ in itself, on a daily basis when you look at cosmetics, whether it's hair, skin, makeup, to um, 
applying, you know, panty liners or nappies in babies, we are constantly exposed to these chemicals, which really do have a known uh, impact on our endocrine system. As you mentioned there, they actually mimic estrogen. So they're known as xenoestrogens. So you mentioned the endocrine system, just for those who aren't fully aware of the full remit of what the endocrine system is, what is it? So it's essentially, if you think about your endocrine system, it's like an orchestra. I always think of our hormones as being individual individual songs or a, or a note and the organs that produce them, whether it's the adrenal glands producing adrenaline um, as being the instrument and the orchestra that is playing when all of those play together, it's in beautiful harmony. But when one bum note is played, it ruins the entire symphony. And so that really to me is the endocrine system is like all of our hormones that are being produced by different glands, by different organs, whether it's in the brain, our ovaries, whether it's our pituitary, whether it's our Mm. adrenal glands. There are so many of these little endocrine glands that produce hormones at all times that are responding to different stimuli. They're all intermingling with each other as well. Exactly. You get a fright, your adrenal gland produces some adrenaline, your heart starts beating faster, you start, you know, you, you start breathing more heavily. A cascade. Of- exactly. It's all of this ability for our body to essentially protect itself. What what are some strategies that are sustainable and easily doable just to at least counteract some of the disruptions to reproductive health from a women's point of view? I think being aware is the first thing because when you, it in reality, it's actually a little bit depressing when you become aware because you look around you and you say, I am surrounded everything, by yeah. everything. Whether it's our sofas and the upholstery, whether it's, you know, the containers that we drink our coffee from. Mm. But I think that level of awareness is certainly when it comes to the things you have a choice about, right? So uh, cosmetics, perfumes, all of them have high level of phthalates within them. And so there are things that you can buy or cosmetics and shampoos, conditioners, etc. that have much lower levels as an app called Think Dirty. And you can actually scan whatever it is and it will tell you the level of dirtiness. In other words, how many different chemical compounds are in it. And that has been a real eye opener for me to see, you know, some of the real household brands and just how dangerous they are from a toxicity point of view. So I think that's kind of something you can definitely do. And then when it comes to consumption, I would never heat any I never, you know, a microwave meal, they should be put into a glass container if you're going to eat mm. them. Um, I don't ever heat, you know, in Tupperware, you would, I would always heat things in you know, glass dishes. Same with the, with the dishwasher, even though it's annoying, I never put um, plastics in the dishwasher. Least, obviously, quality of the eggs is another determining yeah. factor as well. And, you know, just doing some of the sort of reading around fertility, it looks like one biomarker or one representation of at least quantity or ovarian reserve is anti-malarian hormone. For someone who is a woman, you know, with, as part of a couple in her 20s, mid-20s, probably issues about fertility for the average person may not be at the top of their mind. They may not even be thinking about kids. But at what point do you think women should have a sort of a routine screening just to get a a baseline understanding of her own fertility level or capacity should they have, even if they're not thinking of kids for the next 20 years or ever? Honestly, I think this is the whole reason I started my company, Hertility, um, was to give people that license to look for any answers about their body. It's very interesting that you say they may not even be thinking about it or may not even be in their mind. But the reality is that every single month we get a monthly reminder. And when our period is late, we wonder. When our period is early, we wonder. When we have, um, you know, symptoms associated with menstrual dysfunction, we question that. And so really there's an internal dialogue that every woman has and that is asking one of the biggest questions there is, can I have a baby? I mean, I I do think we're moving away from thinking about those questions much earlier, but it still resides within from a very young age, from when we give little babies dolls to play with is this maternal instinct about when will I have a baby? And the fact that we are so connected in everything, we can plan our route to work, we can plan our route on holiday, we can book and organize every single facet of our lives. But one of the biggest game changers within your life is when you have a baby and not being able to plan how, when and if 
is so strange to me. It just goes against everything that um, revolves around being the modern human. Fertility is also a marker of longevity to an extent as well. I mean, if you have more eggs and a greater ovarian reserve, you've got more time to go until you hit menopause, That's which right. is a significantly yeah. deleterious state in a woman's life. How can a woman do things to optimize their longevity, vitality, but also chances of getting pregnant should they wish to next week or next month? What are some sort of things? To me, I think it's so important that from a very young age, we're aware of our reproductive health. There are so many different elements of our life that are affected by our hormones. Yeah. So I, in, in a weird way, I think depending on your age, we should frame the narrative a little bit more differently. If you're talking to a 20 year old, they may not necessarily be interested in their fertility, but they will care about their hormones and they're yeah. so interlinked. And I think that's why we don't test just AMH with fertility. We, were made, we made sure we take a very significant medical history, but also that we test all of the other associated hormones, whether it's thyroid or uterine and, and your so cycling hormones. Luteinizing hormone, FSH, exactly. estradiol, thyroid function. If, you, if we think you have PCOS, we'll test your androgens. All of that is very important in determining what your fertility is, but also your, re, your overall reproductive health and therefore health. So we know that our menstrual cycles have been added as one of the, vi one of the vital signs. And that's a really important thing to recognize that if you have irregular periods, heavy bleeding, too much bleeding, too little bleeding, those are signs that your body is actually under distress. And to me, I find it is one of the biggest mistakes that we've made over the last 30 years is that rather than listening to those notifications that our body gives us, these are very significant notifications that we've now learned to mm. mute, that teenagers go with menstrual dysfunction to their GP and they're prescribed the pill. Painkillers or something even, right? Or the right? pill, yeah. right? So instead of just Papering listening and understanding and, and actually testing their hormones and understanding what is the root cause of this dysfunction, we're just going to put a blanket or put a bandage yeah. band aid over it and put them on the pill. And if you present as a patient with, you know, severe cramps, hormonal acne, weight gain, weight loss, any of those things, and you're put on something that will make that go away, there's no point in your life that you're thinking, today's a good day for that to come back. If you've been put on the pill to, you know, remove any of these symptoms that I mentioned, the only reason you're going to actually decide maybe those symptoms can come back into my life is because you really need to come off it in order to start a family. And it's then people realise, well, actually, I've been on this form of contraception for the last 10 years. I have no mm. idea what my body is doing. And so to me, I think everyone from 18 years on should check in on their reproductive health, know what their hormones are doing. Because when you look at the global trends, the number one prescribed drug in the world is thyroxine. Mm. We have a big problem globally with hormone imbalance yeah. and our hormones dictate our mood, weight, skin, appetite, metabolism, sex drive, yeah. menstrual health. Almost every facet of our life is con controlled by our hormones. And yet when you ask people, you know, how are your hormones? The majority yeah. just don't know. They don't have a, an ability to, to determine what they are. So it's part of our ethos is that, you know, if if we tell people that you need to get your cervical smear test, right? That's yeah. It's kind of a narrative now where we, we almost shame each other if somebody hasn't gone to get their smear yeah. test because, you know... You're not taking care of your health. You're not taking care of yeah. your health. And the chances of surgical, cervical cancer are... 1 in 64. But your chance of having a reproductive health condition at some point in your life are 1 in 3. Wow. So we should screen annually, especially because it's such a dynamic and changing aspect of our life yeah. that is so susceptible to external stimuli. Yeah. So our hormones are very susceptible to changes when we're stressed, hence why our periods will stop, when we're under pressure. You know, there's, there's, they're so interlinked. Are there other things sort of in the run up to, you know, trying to get pregnant. A couple are trying to get pregnant, apart from obviously having intercourse. What are some things pre and post that intercourse can you do to optimize chances of, you know, conceiving? The most basic things are the most powerful things. So what most people really don't take into account is preconception health. Okay. And the fact that so often the emphasis lies on the woman, right? And if you don't get pregnant, it's a, it's a failing. Even our, even yeah. the language that we use around that, she didn't get pregnant, she lost the pregnancy. Yeah. She couldn't. Ovarian failure. Exactly. Or, yeah. it's, and, and actually there's a lot of anthropology that looks at the way that we've framed yeah. so much of 
female anatomy, even the way that we describe um, menstrual blood as effluent or waste. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, the yeah. excessive sperm that uh, and ejaculate is seen as like copious, an, an abundant amount yeah. of sperm. So it's yeah. really it's amazing how uh, how embedded <laughs> that that narrative is. It's interesting. But when we look at um, preconception health, it's the emphasis is on the woman. But very often we think as soon as you're pregnant, that's when you need to be good. But mm. we have such an opportunity in the months prior to conception to optimize our ability to conceive, to reduce external stress, to, at the end of the day, stress reduces our ability to ovulate. But also when we think about all of the things we're putting in our body and the fact that during our menstrual cycle, when our, all of the follicles in our would-be eggs in our ovaries are maturing and getting ready for About that. nine months as uh, well. well. Well, prior to any of this, that, that egg that is going to be released, like you want to make sure that that egg that is released has been nurtured in the most healthy of environments yeah. but prior to conception. But when we look, and so I, I think that, that the egg is so important. It's the largest cell in the body, just yeah. saying. Yeah, and yeah. the sperm is the smallest <laughs> cell in the body, just saying. But the sperm has such an important role. It's placed, it, it gives 50% of the DNA yeah. and yet we just think of that you know that the man shows up and does the party piece but when I mentioned about ovarian stem cells we are born with all the eggs we'll ever have right yeah, yeah. There's, there's not much we can do because we've been exposed since our grandmothers but the sperm there there are um, spermatogonial stem cells and they turn over every three months so you have a significant ability to increase the quality, quantity, concentration of sperm. On the men's side On of the things. men's side, 50% of the DNA yeah, here, yeah. Um, by just improving preconception care and not drinking, not smoking, no, no drugs. And the reason I emphasize drugs here, even though it seems so obvious, is that when we look at our database of the last search we did of 230,000 women, uh, of those trying to conceive, 8% were taking drugs, which I found fascinating, but 40% were still drinking. Mm. And of the 40% who were drinking, about 10% were drinking way above the national limit. So there's still a very I mean, um, important conversation to be had here about the do's and don'ts of getting ready for pregnancy. So, I mean, it's shown that alcohol affects sperm motility and function as well. So clearly on the male side, but also the alcohol will have some effect on the female reproductive health right. as well, right? Right, and it does so in a significant way depending on the time of the month, right? So we often tend to um, separate out. Uh, it's very convenient for us to say that alcohol affects your liver mm. or it affects, you know, your kidneys. Yeah. But actually when you think about the fact that you get you know, you lose balance. It affects your cognitive function as well. And it affects yeah. your ovaries too. So yeah. I often think of our ovaries being pickled. But we know that when you are drinking at certain times, so a big um, a big study was carried out and it looked at your chances of conception depending on when you drank. So if you were drinking uh, in that follicular phase when all your wonderful eggs are getting ready maturing. Um, and maturing, yeah. if you're drinking, you're much less likely to conceive than if you drank during your menstrual phase phase when I guess you're ready rid of that, ah, that effluent. <laughs> I see. The egg that's maturing, so that's the, in the run up to conception and sexual intercourse, that's the kind of preconception part yeah. where you need to do, almost do that prehabilitation to ensure that there's a nurturing rich environment for that egg, the seed, yeah. to mature so it's as optimized as possible, but also the male factors as well, that's optimized as exactly. possible. Don't come near my Don't egg. Don't come near my egg until you're your, subpar sperm. Yeah, until you're suited and booted. Detox. Exactly. <laughs> Is there any signs, I should ask, then, you know, during a woman's menstrual period, you know, presumably I mean, one of the key moments is that Mittelschmerz period, that point of ovulation where you get a rise of the, you know, luteinizing hormone, the LH. In the run up to that and around that time, is that the most fertile window for, you know, increasing the chances of conception? Yes. So it, it still amazes me that we actually will have couples coming for IVF. And so two extremes. Uh, one is that they've just, they're like, we've been trying for a year. And then we say to them, um, have you been timing your intercourse? Okay. And they're like, yeah. I mean, at 11 o'clock at night. And we're like, <laughs> no, um, at a specific time. So like, they're... Actually, they've been trying to conceive for 12 months, but maybe eight of those, they've been having sex at, you know, the start or end or a menstrual time of their period. And they haven't really looked to say, mm. this is when I'm ovulating and this is when I can have sex. The other extreme is that we've had people who still have their hymen intact and they're not having sex the right way at mm. all. But that's there's, there's many other cultural elements to just lack of education. But that to me shows you the level of 
education that we have to account for when it comes to asking someone about their fertility journey, that many people are just so uneducated about their bodies, about conception, about ovulation, about when you can and more specifically when you can't get pregnant. But we know that typically around 14 days after the start of your period, that is that real fertile window. But I will say this, we assume that everyone is, there's a, the te- there's a textbook man for which yeah. the world, the medicine has been built on, but there's also a textbook woman that assumes that we all have a 28-day cycle yeah. and we ovulate on day 14. And actually very few people, only about 30% of women do ovulate on day 14 and Such have that 20. Such a variable 20- range, isn't it? Exactly. And that's where I think statistics can do a real disservice to people because they rely on that golden number to get pregnant. And I think what we need to be doing is investing more time in understanding our own body signals. It's quite actually quite amazing when you start to listen to your own body and understand really noticing, like you said, middle schmerz, which literally means middle pain, so, that painful yeah, release the, of the an, bubble wrap of being an, popped and exactly, one ovary quite, being, egg root being released. That's exactly it. But also the cervical mucus that will change to accommodate that so that pre and post. So that will become thinner, the, the mucus during that fertile? Quite literally like an egg yolk. Oh, okay. Um, um, so it's the, the whites of an egg rather. So quite literally like cracking an egg, which is like, ow, that middle schmerz, the wow, egg has been okay, released. Yeah. And you, you will have quite a... A, at the egg white watery uh, watery yeah. and then quite sticky uh, cervical mucus I love talking about cervical yeah. mucus so, so that, that will be uh, you know a correlative factor for thinking okay thinner cervical mucus with that's, that's more sticky the middle schmutz pain I've, and possibly body temperature changes body temperature changes exactly which are much more subtle and I think they're they're harder to measure to me it's it's much more around noticing that cervical mucus and the change that you're ha- that you have. I mean, there are other there are other dynamic factors that you are generally much more energetic. You have more energy. Estrogen is the most amazing, probably powerful chemical uh, on earth, matched with testosterone. But <laughs> the effects that it has on a, on our overall well being for starters. But during or uh, during ovulation, you'll you're more likely to be more outgoing, confident, have clear f- focus yeah. because of its link with collagen and our Cognitive skin. Cognitive health as well. Well also our collagen in our skin. It, it yeah. literally makes us feel Glow. better. Mother Nature wants us to get pregnant and she's doing everything in her capacity to say, let's get let's get you pregnant. Um let's make you better looking, more confident and obviously more aroused. You mentioned there of you dealing with couples, you know, wanting to go ahead the, down the route of IVF, in vitro fertilization. Now, obviously, again, this is something which I I suspect has a lot of misinformation and myth around it because of Hollywood and stuff we see on TV and general nonsense you see online as well. What does it involve and what are the costs like for IVF? IVF is a technology that has been around for 40 years now, just mm. over 40 years. And it still amazes me that the cost has not gone down. Um, and that Ironically, the success rates for it haven't really gone up so significantly. And I guess that's because we're dealing with quite a multifaceted journey to conception, right? We often think of it about that exactly, um, a sperm and an egg in a dish and we make the magic and we transfer it. One segment of the whole process. That's exactly it. But actually, there are so many different aspects to that, um, namely the the preconception health that the individual is undergoing. And I don't think we do enough thorough triage into patients prior to undergoing a fertility journey. It's again, it's part of what we've built into fertility is that really comprehensive triage Do to understand. Do the bit first. That's it. Let's understand all of the possible reasons why you might not be getting pregnant before you ever embark on a fertility journey. And then once you have that result, then we can say, okay, that's the, like, let's go for it. But the different aspects that are involved there's a stimulation process where you are essentially mimicking mimicking a normal menstrual cycle and maturation of one egg but you're times 20 times 30 you're trying to essentially say how can we make this or times 10 you're trying to make say make sure that you have enough hormones to make sure that not one of those eggs matures but that actually multiple eggs as many as possible you're ramping up the internal biology to make it as fertile as possible exactly to mature as many eggs as possible so that you can then do an egg collection and and retrieve them. That's also why with IVF you can get multiple pregnancies. It's frequent to get twins and triplets and... Exactly. I think 
Historically, the reason for multiple pregnancies in IVF is that traditionally clinics would actually transfer more than one embryo. So they would oh. they would put two or three in in the hopes that one would take. And then you dangerous. would see quite dangerous, exactly. And so you were you had um incidents of Octomom where they had <laughs> all, all eight embryos. I mean, can you imagine transferring that many, <laughs> hoping one would take? And guess what? They've all they've all um implanted. Now the law has really changed to say actually that there's a real tr- um emphasis on just transferring one um, because there's no difference actually in your success, um, ironically. But the other reason is that embryos tend to, even when you transfer one embryo and one pregnancy, you still might get, there's still a much higher incidence of twins because whatever it is about that, the process of, you know, fertilization in the lab, the embryo, the embryo is much more prone to splitting mm. into identical twins. And I think that's probably likely because instead of when you said we put an egg in addition with a, with some sperm um, and we hope for fertilization, actually the majority of cases we put an egg in a dish and we take one sperm and we inject it in to ensure fertilization. And in that injection process... You're cleaving you ever, the you egg potentially. Absolutely, really injecting that egg. If you ever watch the process yeah. of what's called ICSI, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection, the, the egg is really fighting against it's that like needle going in. a bubble that's in. about to burst, isn't it? It really is. So it could be that that process really just kind of weakens the zona pellucida, which is the external cell um, or cell wall of the of the egg. So you're more prone to identical twinning. Considering that you said that IVF hasn't changed much in terms of its success rate and po- cost over the decades it's been around, what can someone expect in terms of cost and how long would the process of IVF take from the moment they sit down with someone in a clinic and say, you know, I want to do this IVF process? What's the timeline and cost? Sort of in the sort of several thousand pound range. Oh, or in terms more? of cost, or yeah. uh, at a minimum seven thousand pounds, 7, and that's like if you're lucky with everything, no bells and whistles. That's yeah. just straight up. The reality is, certainly in the UK, anyway. I mean, in, in the America, in, in America, you add a zero to everything. Wow. Um, you're talking seventy thousand by the time you have a baby, but they say on average it takes three rounds of IVF. So if you think that on average a basic cycle of IVF is seven thousand yeah. pounds, you're talking twenty one thousand pounds by the time you've and how many weeks would one cycle last of that whole treatment phase? Per cycles, it depends on whether you're considering a cycle. So a, a, a treatment cycle would be stimulation, taking the eggs, fertilizing, transferring, and then actually transferring everything from that is considered one cycle. One cycle. So um, it could be many, many months by the time you've... So one cycle could be many months. Yeah. Wow. Typically, it could occur within a month, whereby you do the stimulation. Within two weeks, you've procure the oocytes, you do the fertilization, and then you would do the transfer a few days later. We're really moving away from fresh transfers. Actually, a lot more clinics are doing frozen cycles whereby they would freeze them. They might do a second stimulation cycle, freeze them, and then start to transfer. What are the sort of, you know, the science behind egg freezing? And again, how effective can that be to almost put pause on that egg and still have that egg fresh that's maybe 10 years frozen, it's still fresh. What's the science of that? So the science is that it's actually very successful, but it really does depend. Everything depends on the age that you froze that egg. So um, if you're going to start thinking about freezing at 39, 40, in fact, um, our clinical team did a big study looking at 10 years worth of data of women who froze their eggs and nobody over 40 who went back to transfer those and those you know fertilized eggs actually were able to conceive the quality and the age in which you freeze your eggs is the most important thing but freezing eggs at a young age has actually quite a significant success rate in terms of being able to fertilize and transfer later just speaking to you for the last you know hour or so just learned so much about fertility and i'm sure we could talk for a lot more um but before i let you go you have one question for me i have no idea what it is okay so given that we can now rederive any cell type, and potentially make it into a gamete, sperm or an egg. And if you were to take your own skin cells or whatever Mm -hmm. it is and re-derive them into a sperm cell of your own, you'd technically be cloning, right? So you're taking a clone of yourself. Would you do it? To then, you know, grow a clone? Would you create a human using your own sperm? If I could ensure that there would be no hitches along the way, which would result in, you know, some horrible Frankenstein experiment, <laughs> you know, being ended up. So there was this kind of like, you know, zombie current or some weirdness happening to that, uh, you know, uh, embryo. 
then I would consider it. But also, I I don't know, maybe call me old fashioned or just I, I love to sometimes leave things to nature. You know, I watched this film, which is one of my favorite films with Ethan Hawke called Gattaca. Yes. Have you seen it? Yes, of course. Where I make my MSc students watch it. Yeah, a fantastic we're film. we're moving towards that. <laughs> so, you know, when you've, and, and essentially, you know, making one of my skin cells into a sperm cell and cloning myself, that's going towards this dystopian future where everyone is, you know, you get these super designer babies. I almost want to leave it up to nature, but... I, w- I like the fact that we're able to look at genetic mutations in these cells and see if anything could go wrong to screen for it. So if I could screen for it uh, and make sure, you know, the natural uh, embryo is okay, I'd prefer to go down that route. But I would definitely give a lot of consideration to a clone <laughs> of myself because... Wouldn't the world be better with more Dr. Karens? <laughs> well, yeah, arguable, <laughs> arguable, I don't know. I already have a clone. I have an identical twin sister. So yes, yeah. technically she's my bad. Biological clone, so oh, we definitely. Wow. I, I'm already living in a, in a universe with another version of me. <laughs> Helen, thank you so much for coming down today, having a chat about fertility and infertility, more importantly. And I think people listening to this, watching this, are going to be a lot more aware of something they probably should have been from the beginning, not just from you know wanting to have babies, but just for their health and understanding their biology a bit more. Yeah, I think there's a big education piece that just goes back to the basics that we should all learn from a very young age. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much to Dr. Helen O'Neill. Hopefully some of those insights on fertility prove useful for you too. Now, on to the myth section of our podcast, If It Ducks Like a Quack. So the first myth in light of my episode next week on all things breast and breast cancer Is it a myth or not that you only get breast cancer if it's been in your family or if it's hereditary? This one is a total myth. Whilst family history and hereditary factors and certain gene mutations which may be in your family, for example the BRCA2 gene, that's only one part of various factors which can contribute to the development of breast cancer. If you have a strong family history for breast cancer, you may be offered earlier screening and even sometimes what's known as a prophylactic surgery. You might be offered surgery to remove part of or all the breasts if you are particularly high risk. In some cases, you might be offered prophylactic surgery or surgery before something bad has happened if you are particularly high risk. But there are various other factors which contribute to the development of cancer. For example, there are several common carcinogens which people are often exposed to. Smoking, alcohol, viruses sometimes can contribute to cancer or even exposure to other carcinogenic chemicals. So whilst it is important to be aware of your family history, it's also equally important to do regular self-examinations on breasts, which I'll be covering next week. And also, if you notice something abnormal or something that's suddenly changed and you're concerned, you should go check it out. Our second myth today is something that I came across on TikTok and loads of people messaged me asking if it was true. It was a viral hack online showing people how to remove a hickey or a bruise in the neck area just by using an egg beater. Now, to set the scene, this video got over 30 million views and shows a young woman with a large bruise on her neck which she had got from her partner who had presumably sucked on the area and caused a massive bruise. And then she could be seen using a whisk to try and whisk away and break away this collection of blood clots underneath the skin. And then she showed an after picture where the bruise seemed to have disappeared. Now, when you're dealing with bruises, there are a few things that you can do based on evidence and science. You could leave it alone and your body will get rid of it naturally within 10 to 14 days as it reabsorbs the blood. Other effective measures include using some sort of concealer or makeup to hide the bruise. When you first get the bruise and you've knocked yourself or you've sustained the injury, this is the moment not to use any invasive measures or anything which can cause any external trauma, like using a whisk. In that first 12 to 24 hours, it's likely that there will still be some inflammation and irritation, and any additional inflammation or irritation could make that bleeding worse. What you wanna do in that initial phase is actually use some cold compresses or ice or anything cold. This causes the blood vessels, which are leaking the blood out, they causes them to narrow and vasoconstrict, thus limiting the size and severity of any hickey or bruise. Once 24 hours has elapsed, 
collapsed, then you can't use any more cold. At this point, you need to start to switch to using some heat. Using heat after the 24 hour mark increases the blood flow to that area, which increases the dispersion and destruction of those old blood globules and increases the reabsorption of that blood. And now for crowd science, the chance for you to ask me questions. My first one is from Sarah in Suffolk. Hi doctor, in 2021 I was involved in a head-on car crash with a drunk driver. Since the crash my neck pops and cracks with movement and feels like it's grinded. And it aches. Why is this? Is it the old-fashioned whiplash? So if you're listening to this, you probably won't be able to see what I can see, but Sarah has actually sent in a picture of the car after the car crash and safe to say that the car was left in a pretty horrible condition. Now, whilst it's difficult for me to give you any specific medical advice on your specific condition about your neck making this popping and cracking sound every time you turn your head, because I'm not able to examine you, I don't have any of your, you know, x-rays or any other imaging you may have got, or, you know, I don't have this background details on you. What I would say is if you sustained a pretty horrible traumatic injury, particularly if it's a chronic injury, that predisposes you to things like osteoarthritis in any joints that were affected. So if you've got a chronic wrist injury from punching something, it increases your risk of chronic wear and tear and developing osteoarthritis in your joints. Similarly, after your horrible car crash, you may have got a degree of wear and tear and damage to the cervical spine, the uh, region of your vertebral column near your neck or in your neck. And this may predispose a faster development of osteoarthritis, and this can contribute to this cracking and popping sound. Now, again, this is based purely on the limited information I've got from you, but if you are experiencing chronic pain in your neck, you are experiencing these odd symptoms, and if you at all experience any altered neurology where, you know, you get any shooting nerve pain and things like that, you should definitely go and see your GP or get yourself referred to someone who is a specialist in that area who will be able to assess you fully, maybe a spinal surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon, or maybe even a neurosurgeon. So I've got one more question from Gail about spots, which I'll be answering in this week's episode of Crowd Science Extra. Gail asks, hello from Australia. My husband says that squeezing pimples in a certain area in your face is dangerous as it could affect your brain. Is this a true fact or an urban myth? If you want to hear my full answer to this question, make sure you download Crowd Science Extra for answer to this and many more questions. All you have to do to get access to this is subscribe to the Referral Plus to get access to these questions and ad-free listening of all episodes. And hit the Try Free button at the top of the page to begin your free trial today. And don't forget, if you have a question you want me to answer and you want it answered on this episode, get in touch at theReferralPod.com. And we are done. Make sure you subscribe for weekly episodes and hit the notification button so you don't miss out on juicy medical goodness. I'll see you next time.